this uh, challenge stream for the uh, Sackets SM, uh, the Swedish high school championships in edge security. It was a CTF that ran this weekend from Friday to Sunday, uh, targeted uh, towards um, Swedish high school students and beginners. Um, it was a CTF competition and uh, I've been going through the solutions to the challenges. Uh, most of them I haven't previously looked at, so I'm trying to approach them um, as if I was playing the competition and try to explain uh, how to approach them, what tools to use, what to think about, and so on. And today we will continue the... Uh, solving the challenges and uh, last time we did the pawnable and crypto challenges uh, except for the last one we'll see um, I was supposed to like prepare a little bit for that uh, for today I have been looking at a little bit but I don't have like a full solution uh, prepared so we'll, we'll save that one uh, towards the end and then we'll see if um, if we'll actually do it end-to-end -end or um, I'll just explain the the, the, the theory. Uh, so anyway, uh, we're gonna do uh, the forensics challenges, and then this web challenge, and then this boot to root sequence of of challenges. And uh, yeah, some people in the chat. Hello, good evening, or whatever time it is for you. And uh, of course, the question: What is boot to root? I will explain when we get there. It's a it's a sequence of challenges, and. Um, as I said, if there's any uh, technical problems, if you have any questions and anything, just write in the chat, uh, or you know, if you have some extra information about the challenge or what to, want to comment on it. Uh, with that said, let's uh, head into the uh, forensics challenges. So I'm just gonna set the status here. Challenge name is this. Okay, so it's a challenge called Corrupted Cat. Here's a nice cat picture. We get a file. We uh, can, it, I mean, it has a JPEG file extension. Is it a JPEG? It does seem to be a JPEG. So what happens if we just open it in an image viewer? Um, it does look like a picture of a cat. There is something strange up here. You can see it in the uh, middle of the picture here. There is some black box. There is something something strange there. So let's see with Binwalk if there are anything else in this picture. It does only seem to be like the image data. Um, Someone asked what, what forensics <laughs> forensics is. Uh, yeah, so forensics is a category where you have to like analyze uh, files, disk images, uh, network captures, and try to find some data. So we've done some initial looking here. Uh, it does seem to be like a JPEG image. There's something strange with the JPEG image, and we're looking for some. We're looking for the flag inside this file. So let's open up the file with the hex editor i'm using 010 editor which i really really like and i'm going to show you why so here you can see let me just just these panels a little bit so here is the hex uh, data here is uh, an ascii representation of it and you can see that it did automatically apply uh like a file structure uh thing so this editor has has um, definitions for a bunch of file formats so it will parse the file format into this uh, uh, structure here so we can actually know what the different pieces of data um, is used for so um that's uh, really interesting but before we dig into that we're actually going to do just a cheap thing we're gonna use the strings tool to just see if there is anything 
embedded in the you know if they would have just put the flag straight up whoa look at this uh so we could actually even do this and like grip for the flag so it does actually seem that we don't even have to actually look and uh, look at and analyze the data we have something here looking like a um flag so let's just you know save what did we did here and well let's see if this is the flag ah, i was okay so basically what they have done was just taken this uh jpeg image and just just in somewhere in the middle replaced a few bytes with the flag and the the image displays mostly correct still you have this you get this block here uh which is due to how the jpeg file format uh works so yeah always use file always use strings to uh and always use bin walk to analyze uh your files uh it's like uh one two three you can always uh, do before doing anything else uh that's trickier so let's move on to the second one called beautiful birds uh the most beautiful blue mess that's the name of a of a bird i've ever heard and there's a file here that we can download it's a wave file so it's a sound file and hello okay try to download this fine let's uh oh i don't think i have the sound from the vm hooked up to the stream but um i'm listening to this and it does kind of sound like a bird uh chirping something feels a little bit off uh let me see give me one second here i'm gonna just see if i can add the Let's see if yeah now you should hear it okay so this is what the sound what the file looks like uh what it sounds like and uh, we guess that somewhere in this file um we have the uh, uh, flag hidden so let's make a directory copy this file over uh, again, check that it is in fact just a wave file. We can use bin walk to see if there's anything else. Okay, so this is a problem with so if you have big files, bin walk will find a lot of different things because it does like pattern matching. Here it's claiming there's some like MySQL internal data structures in here. I'm gonna take a guess that that's just uh, by chance. And if you do strings as well, you will probably get, I mean, this is a fi fairly large um, file. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't give you anything really. Uh, so let's open this in an actual uh, audio uh, program. So I use uh, Audacity on uh, Linux. It's a good, uh, simple tool for working with audio files. And We'll just import this file. And here we have the uh, wave form of this file. So whenever you're looking at an audio signal or like any kind of signal at all, uh, typically you don't want to look at the wave form shape because that typically doesn't really give, any, give you any information. Uh, what you want to look at is the frequency uh, content. So you want to switch to a spectrogram and see if there is anything that looks uh, suspicious. So if you see here in the middle, there is something. Oh, look. Uh, 
it actually spells out the flag uh, in the in the spectrogram by by using like sounds of different frequencies. So this this plot, the way this is plotted here, is you have time on the x-axis and then you have frequency on the y-axis and then the color is how intense uh, that frequency is at that time um, in the signal. So using like by using a couple of frequencies and varying their intensity throughout the signal, you can like paint the picture here. So uh, let me see if we can just get it to like uh, let's just stretch it so I can read it properly. And now I think we can just transcribe this and it says is this the lead speak uh, so is this the sound with the zero I guess of uh, and then what does it say we can zoom in here a bit There's an underscore, and then what does this say? It's like a one L, no. Uh, should maybe. Um, Do we have these? Is this an E and an N? Silence. Yes. S -A I L E N C E. Yes. Is this the sound of silence? That's uh, that's what it says. Thank you, chat. <clears throat> so let's submit this, and that is indeed correct. So um. We used Audacity, looked at the spectrogram, and then we find the found the flag. So that's good. And we can close this down. No saving. Let's check this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> next challenge is called Unzip Me. So just going to update this. So we are given a rocku.zip and is this a zip archive? Yes. The description says, yes, uh, I found this zip file, but I, but I can't uh, get to the contents. Can you uh, see what it contains? Okay, so we can use the unzip-l to list um, the contents of a zip file. And it seems to contain uh, flag.txt, so can we try to unzip this? and it asks for a password okay so uh, there is uh, this is a password protected zip now this um, the name of the zip file here is a, is a hint so there is a famous word list called rocku uh, it's a huge list of popular passwords. So, first of all, let's check that the flag isn't just actually in the in the file. So this is just a hex dump of the file. It doesn't seem to be the case. So probably the um, password is one of these uh, Rocku 
uh, passwords. So um, ideally, we should just have to try all of those uh, passwords, but there are a lot of them. It's in this file, we have 14 million uh, passwords. Uh, so how do we try this? We need some kind of tool to just try all this, uh, all of these passwords. Um, so like Linux zip file password brute force f crack zip is something i recognize uh can you just give it a dictionary yes um cool and this is in the ubuntu uh repository so let's just f crack zip yes um so let's install that okay so how do you do this um you give it a dictionary rocku.txt and then um the file to crack okay rocku.zip so let's just try this uh, did we should we do this dictionary So in this mode, we read passwords for my file. Do you provide the Oh, is it a separate dash P? Ah, okay. This is why you should properly read the manual. So we should do this. Uh it says possible password found so it has some kind of feature to so now it went through a whole bunch of password that it says is possible so i think you can add like a command for it to actually try yeah so this slash dash u it will actually properly verify the password so we try this again oh so it says password found so first of all let's just write some notes for this so we should unzip try to unzip this file now um, with the zip file with the password extracting flag.txt and here we have a flag so so yeah um it's uh like a light introduction to like password brute forcing with the uh, dictionaries. So uh, if sometimes it's not enough to use, I mean, sometimes it's not the password um, just straight up from a dictionary. It could also of course be like some variant of that or an actual pure brute force. Um, then you can actually use uh, things like Hashcat uh, to uh, utilize or like GPUs uh, to crack the passwords. There's like tools to uh, convert an encrypted zip file into the format that Hashcat uh, can uh, work with, uh, I think. And or if not Hashcat, then Yon the Ripper is another uh, popular password cracking uh, tool. So those two tools are good to keep in mind when it comes to password cracking okay um so now we come to one of the sponsor challenges uh, an apple a day from one of the sponsors um so
here. Um, recently, there's been a, a lot of media leaks about uh, health status for some uh, famous people, and uh, yeah, people are wondering: Is there like a doctor who is uh, snooping around in the people's medical records? And attached there is information about uh, medical record accesses from all uh, healthcare centers in Sweden during February. Are there doctors who are acting suspiciously? And we're given a file. So let's download the file. So this is some like log analysis uh, challenge then, uh, I guess. Um, so. Just gonna close this down and close this down. Okay, so we are given a CSV file. Is this actually a CSV file? Looks like it's just a text file, yes. So here you can see that the CSV file contains the doctor ID, timestamp, uh, patient zip code. So, and you can see that the doctor IDs are, it looks like parts of flags. So maybe we are supposed to analyze this log to find some suspicious behavior from the timestamp and the patient zip code, and then take the corresponding doctor IDs and combine them into a flag. So how large is this file? It contains almost 2 million uh, rows. So of course we can't do this uh, manually. Um, so what could we do here? I mean, if the doctor IDs would have been unique um, or uh, sorry I mean if if we knew that we were only looking for like one doctor ID we could maybe just look like who had have looked at the most number of records uh, because maybe that's suspicious now I think we're looking for a few doctors but well we can do that anyway actually so Let's write some code for this. So, I mean, this is something you also probably could use a like a proper log analysis tool for. You could probably like import this into um, like Kibana or um, some of the commercial tools or whatever. Um, but uh, we will try it with just some some uh, some Python code. So we open this log file. Actually, we can use the uh, Python uh, CSV reader thing to just do this clean and easy. Um, so the file is called uh, journal access. The delimiter to a comma. Don't care about the culture. And now we can do four row in CSV reader. We'll just print one of them and then break just to make sure that this works. Okay, that's good. Um, can we like discard the headers? Um, I 
I guess we could just do this. We should get rid of it. Just advance the iterator one step. Yes. Okay. So let's do. Someone's asking, are you the author of some challenges there? Yes, uh, I am the author of some challenges and I have, uh, I think, we, yeah, we have solved all the challenges I was an author of. It was uh, uh, the, these two web challenges, Perfect the Desk and Color and the Shapes, and the uh, BitSnick and Sita Crypto Pro, those two challenges. Um, and then I know a little bit about some of the challenges because I've talked to the other uh, authors, but I've been trying to, like, keep myself away from it so that I can do this stream and go into these uh, without knowing things in advance. So let's just do the most basic thing here and just order these by which doctor, um, or like group them uh, by doctor. So we have the doctor ID timestamp and the patient zip so um, we do this uh, we try to get an entry for that doctor otherwise we get an empty list and to this empty list we just append these this tuple zip code and then we can first of all just print a how many unique doctors there are. Um, maybe I can't do this. So we do if this ID not in doctors, then we just create an empty list to make sure that that exists and then we can append to this oh we are breaking that's also why so now we let it run on the whole file so we have 2999 different um doctors so let's Uh, generate a list with um, the each doctor and the number of lookups they've made um, And then we sort this uh, sorry we sort this based on this um, the second value the number of lookups and then we just print the like top 10 values. Uh, wait. All right, I want the um just look up this basic thing yeah okay so it was what i was looking for um sort it based on the second entry and then we print the top 10 we try to run this again Okay, uh, I sorted it in the uh, wrong direction. I get. I think we get the minimum number of lookups here. So 
I think we should, should set this reverse to true and then try it again, run the analysis. Oh, it's called reverse. Run it again. So we do have, yeah, some different entries. Um, maybe that's, um, I don't know. I don't see any clear pattern. Just seems to be a bunch of first halves of uh, these. Uh, so maybe we have to do a little bit more of a deep uh, analysis then and try to think about um, what else could be suspicious. Like if you look at patients from a lot of different zip codes, maybe that could be um, interesting. So instead of... Instead of making a list for each doctor, we make a set. And to this set, we just add the zip code. And then we do just the number of different unique zip codes. Seems to be roughly the same uh, doctors. Let's see if there's anything again in the, the description. So I'm just going to check this. Um, so famous people from all over the country. So maybe this is about actually understanding. Okay, so let me explain um, Swedish zip codes. They are probably similar to um, how it works in a lot of countries. Basically, you have the first two digits being the general region of Sweden. So maybe we should check if there's anyone who has been looking at um, people from like a, a wide geographical spread. So what if we uh, limit ourselves to just the two first two digits uh, of the zip code? And let's run this again. And here we see hundred different initial regions. So this piece here is highly suspicious. Um, it's very interesting um, because you can see most of the others are restricted to like a single region and this has been looking at two different ones and what would it be if we combine these two together I think because this is his peak in maybe. Uh, okay, so I don't, maybe it's both of these, maybe it's just the last one, but this is definitely suspicious. So let's just copy this into our notes. Um, So 
What if we expand it a little bit and take the three first digits of the zip code? Yeah, you still get this one as a clear outlier. So what could we do? We could look at, first of all, if we just search for this entry um, in the access logs, could it be that it's someone is accessing it at about the same time? So, It's, uh, it's a bit of a tricky one. Um, because this is definitely suspicious behavior. Um, so yeah, let's, let's consider the timings then. So what we can do is, um, I guess if we like sort this by by time and then you look right around when this one is making accesses maybe um, yeah let's let's try that so um, Mm. How do we want to do that? <clears throat> we just make another lookup table, timestamps, and for every I guess we could actually just make a list. So we want to parse these time uh, formats. So Python our state time from string. Um, yeah, something like this. So, because we want to convert this from a from a human readable uh, timestamp to like in just a, it's a just a Unix timestamp. So the timestamp, uh, year, month, date, hour, minute, second. That sounds good. So we will add to this a tuple of uh, timestamp as the first key, uh, the first item in the tuple, and then just the ID and the zip code. And then let's just make sure this works by printing um, uh, printing out one row and just seeing that it works. It is a bit on the slow side. Maybe I should kill this Python script that I'm running in the background. I'm trying to prepare something for a different challenge. Oh, right. It's created a datetime object. Uh, we want to have that just as a... as just an integer. Uh, Python 3 datetime to... Uh, Unix timestamp. Uh, uh, uh. 
Okay, so this is how you would do it. Just need to convert this properly. Just print this here and also import time. Print this out. Okay, yeah, that looks better. So delete this and then we just sort this by the timestamp and then the idea is that we uh, one moment Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, anyway, so now we have we will have all of these things uh, in timestamp order. So let's just print them out. So for one moment, let's just comment this out. Uh, and um, We unpack these values again, the ID and the uh, zip, file, uh, zip code, and then we print this again. Uh, timestamp, doctor ID, and zip code. So let's just run that and see that it works. Another thing you also could do in this case, I mean, this is like on the edge a little bit about how much data it is, but one thing, one thing you could do is just like import this into like a SQL uh, database. Um, oh, sh I chose the wrong. Also, we're gonna save this T uh, log time sorted. So uh, T is a program that will take standard input and write it both to a file and output it again. So like think of like a T pipe. So it's like coming in and both being written down to a file and then also uh, uh, printed out on the standard out. So we can just get the output and write it to a file at the same time. Assuming I didn't make a mistake. We should get some results. Very soon. Okay. Maybe it was a little bit unnecessary to actually just print everything out. Uh, so now if we grep for this, I mean, we know that this doctor is uh, suspicious. And if we look around at what times they did things, I'm just trying to see some kind of pattern here, but um, it's you know things happening pretty much every second, and they're like different doctors before and after uh, so yeah that doesn't really give us anything um, so yeah let's comment this out and what did we have we had
So what can we do more? What other things would be suspicious? Um, maybe some of these uh, zip codes are a bit strange. Oh, so that zip code is only ever accessed by hmm yeah I guess we could do So we definitely have, I think we're looking for three different pieces of uh, of the flag, like a first part, like a middle part, and then an end part. So we did some, maybe it's like we did something with uh, the uh, zip codes. Maybe it's like one thing about the IDs and one thing about the timestamps and one thing about the zip codes. Uh, When we did the initial So there's a question here, how realistic do these types of challenges tend to be as in are the met uh, are the metrics supposed to be similar to real forensic work or designed to be with a more meta CTF challenge in mind? Yeah, so that varies a little bit. Some forensics challenges are more about like showcasing a specific technique of like hiding data or restoring files or whatever. And some forensic challenges are more designed to be like more or less like a real scenario. Um, so we could be looking at something odd. But I would bet that some of these, I'm both, a lot of these like zip codes are actually randomly generated. I think a lot of these doesn't actually exist. Um, so again, let's let's do the thing we did again. Just check how many times each uh, uh, each doctor appears and. So we have seen this one before, but this could just mean that it is a very uh, doctor that just works a lot. Uh, this one is kind of a little bit of an outlier as well. So let's say that, but, but then we have all these like around 600 something does not really, um, you know, stick out. But let's look from the other direction is there like some doctors that are very inactive uh, no doesn't really seem like it um, so Hmm. Maybe so. What we could do is look at the different uh, zip codes instead and look at, at it from that angle. So we can try to see um, 
for every zip code how many uh, how many doctors um, are there that have been looking in the, uh, in that one um, so zip codes here we sort this based on this one. So let's run this again. Uh, yeah, so this is a little bit of a, I mean, I don't really know what to do and in, in what order here. Um, so you can see that seems to be pretty even spread. Let's look at it from the other end again. There should probably be a ton of just ones. Yeah. So let's filter out. Um, The ones with just a single doctor in them. Let's see what's the second. Then we get some zip codes with just two and three and so on. Uh, but that's also not not the problem problem really if we're working with the whole zip code. Maybe we should just do first three digits again. Oh, yeah, then it's the same. Hmm. Any suggestions from the crowd? Um, a bit, uh, I guess uh, I mean if we do think so one suggestion maybe look at the access time um yeah okay so First of all, in this, uh, um, so what you can do here, I guess, is, I mean, we have this sorted uh, list of all the timestamps, all the 1.7 million of them. Uh, I guess we could try to like see if there's any doctor working at like suspicious times, but I guess I mean doctors work all the time. Uh, so yeah, someone said sold someone sold it by searching for a string that looked like an actual flag. Yeah, so. And so one thing here is that if we think that this would be the start, could six be an S? That's more of, I mean, usually you use five for, I think that this could be like unusual, but that would mean that, I don't know, let's, let's not really go there yet. Uh, so uh, access times. Yes, so what would be strange access patterns if you maybe like in a single day, like a certain doctor should meet a certain number of patients or 
somewhat uh, something like that. Um, so maybe if we could just like bucket them per day uh, and then uh, do something there. Mm. So let's split this thing up so we can actually So can I think we should be able to use this to like bucket them into Yes, we could take the year just year and year day would be great. Can I year day if we do this what is it called okay why day right so we I mean the year is always this was supposed to be from February so actually we only care about this variable so um we need to do uh, doctor days. So a lookup is like we make our key here the tuple doctor ID and this uh, day. So if the key is not in this doctor days then we make this a uh, a list and then we add uh, maybe like the patient uh, zip code sorry we append and now we could what we could do we could just try to print a little bit of this so we have the doctor days and then do um we could print everyone that meets a certain uh, threshold for this doctor day in items we could do start out like if um sorry uh, this is the doctor day patient sip and then we can split this up into the doctor id and year day and if the number of sips are let's start with like above 20 then we print the doctor so if the doctor looked at more than 20 patients in a single day then we print that let's wait a little bit i mean this is a little bit what it is uh, analyzing uh, logs when you're not really sure what you're looking for Though I'm not sure how realistic that is. Maybe this should have had a little bit more realism to it. Okay, uh, that was actually a bunch. So uh, we see that we have things like 60. So let's just increase the threshold again. And then this time also save this T. Doctor Days log. So you just wait for this to run. I 
think I should kill this thing running in the background. This will probably not complete. Um, okay, it's a little bit slow. Oh, there wasn't... Wasn't there a single one above 60? So... There are a few... It should be at 60 then. Uh, now I'm doing something. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm stupid. I was looking at I was printing the wrong thing. So so let's do this at twenty again. Sorry, I was I was thinking that this was the length. This was this is actually the which day this happened. Uh, so mm -mm, that's not correct. So letting this run again, I should probably have just like imported this into like a database and set up some indices. Um, okay, so first of all, how big was this file now? Is this worth looking through? It's like 47,000, uh, a lot of them at like 20 something. So if we find an outlier, like let's up it to we had some 28 there. Yeah, let's let's go up a little bit to like 29 and run this again. Um, I should just do this in a list and sort it instead, instead of trying to like pick a threshold. So while the code is running, I'll do that. Um, so. Oh. oh yeah here again we see that so let's let's uh, let's run this code again while we take a look at this thing uh, so we saw a 40 uh, probably just wait for this code to run instead I did I forget to remove the yeah okay sorry this one um, yeah again I, I took the wrong piece of code stupid of course run it again but uh, if we again look at this, first of all, I'm going to close this huge file here. Um, we saw that there was... So yeah, so this doctor is still suspicious. Like looking at a lot of extra patients uh, every day. And I did a mistake. Oh my god! So that's further um, suspicion. On this doctor. 
so So yeah, I guess we have two out of three pieces. Yeah, you can see this one is like top every time. And by by a big margin, I don't think there was anyone else above 29. Um, so, um, that means we're still missing. Uh, some part. Uh, yeah, I have no idea what that would be. So we looked at the timestamps. So you can see here that um, here, like all the accesses of more than 29 patients in the same day is by this same doctor so that is very suspicious so i mean there is this like cheesy idea of trying to like make this so this could be like unusual or un Yeah, I don't know. Let's uh, let's see if we can do this. The the logs started with the IDs, right? So we should do like um, then it would have so this in total it should be eight characters so two characters plus five characters and then not a curly bracket and then this would be like an l or a one Oh, sorry, and then maybe make it a like case insensitive. That does not seem to be working, though. Um, So it's not unusual. It could be on if this is like a lead speak G. What English words starts uh, So Matthias, maybe you could provide a small, some nudge in the right direction because, uh, yeah, I have absolutely no idea what to do here uh, right now. So what we have looked at, we looked at the how many accesses per day, how many different time, sorry, how many different zip codes. Uh, we found two suspicious, or maybe like this one is a little bit suspicious. Oh, okay, so this B4DD is the start. Uh, that's 
interesting and also where did our analysis go wrong then must be this doctor that works a lot um, How did we find this one then? It was uh, now this is very maybe we should actually import it into a database. Average working time per day for each doctor is suggested. Okay. Uh, so for each doctor, we Let's take the the timestamp add this for each doctor in each day we add this and then um, we can go through this. So working times for each doctor. So for each uh, for each doctor day and their uh, timestamps in this doctor day. Uh, then we do the doctor ID and the year day expand that and then we take um we take the highest and lowest um, so first if this doctor id is not in working times then um we create a list of working times and then we calculate we take the um the timestamp list or set actually and we make it a list and we sort it um, and then we take the first and the last element take the difference between those um, you can just take the and this is the working time. And then we add this working time to this thing. I think we should switch the order here because it will be sort of descending order. So, um, so now we have for uh, for each doctor we have the um, working time and the different working times for each day uh, and the doctor ID and then we could print the uh, can we is there already like a math average 
otherwise we could just do import um, just take min of this list print it together with the doctor ID um, let's run this um, doctor mean working hours Just wait for this to run. And uh, sort this. This one is very strange. Wait, is that even? I think something's wrong. Wait, how many seconds are there in a day? 60 seconds times 60 minutes times 24. That's 80. Okay, so you can actually work this many seconds in a day. So in that case, we would have uh, this would be the flag. Bad doc, bad doctor stop peeking. Okay, this is a flag. So in summary, we got one from the number of different regions that looked at, one from the number of the average working time per day and one from uh what is it like the number of total lookups i think but not the worst one but the second worst one for some reason and if we put this together we get this flag which is correct Okay, great. But that's a little bit some some techniques you can use for log analysis. As I said, if you do this in any more like serious fashion. Uh... Yeah, so the question is, how would you know that it started with the bad? What metric made that doctor unique? Yeah, I'm a little bit confused about this because I was pretty sure this one was like a total outlier. Uh, so um, we'll have to ask the challenge author about that. Uh, anyway, tools that you could have used, for example, Kibana, uh, is called, uh, is Greylog, like does that include, them? maybe that's not so much the analysis, more the uh, collection of the logs. Um, what is this, the, the, the commercials, uh, Splunk uh, is uh, a big uh, log analysis uh, tool, a big commercial one, but you can use, uh, for, use it for free a little bit, I think. Um, there are also other tools that you can run locally, I think. But yeah, I mean, this is a huge uh, area. Um, so that we just settled for some Python uh, scripting here. But you see, the problem was that like, it was very slow. Like what you want to do is you want to like import this into a database where it can be indexed so that you can search and slice and aggregate in all the different dimensions. Um, but yeah, that's... Uh, challenge 
So let's close a few things down. And now we let move on to the tumbled zip. Uh, I actually accidentally put my zip file in my Tumblr. Good luck, file.zip. Oh, um, let's see again. Uh, so we have this. Uh, we get this zip file. Seems to be a zip file. Can we check what file is in it? So there's something missing, something corrupt. Okay, so what we can do then is this uh, unzip tool. Uh, I think it is the unzip tool. Oh wait, is it the zip tool? Uh, one of them has like a repair feature that we could try. Oh, of course, we should run like strings. There's a flag.txt. If we just do a hex dump, it's a small file. Uh, I think it is the zip tool that has the... It's like a fix. Yeah, here. So... If you run it with the FF or like F, it tries to like extract, it tries to salvage parts of the uh, zip file. So let's see, you need some, oh, yeah, exactly. So you give it the, you, the zip dash FF for like really, really try to fix it. Give it the zip file and then give it like an out thing. And let's see if it works. Uh, Comment truncated, ignoring, could not find. Okay, it thinks that it is a multi part zip. Uh, maybe just skip that. Did it manage to do something? So someone suggested zip details. No central directory found. Okay, so. What we're going to do now is we're going to open up this in our hex editor again. Uh, and this. So what we're going to do now for comparison, we're going to open up the zip file we had in the uh, unzip me. Or actually, just let's 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 create a uh, a zip file ourselves. So let's create um, a flag.txt. Someone suggests a zip details dash v. I will not use this. Let's uh, still gives no central directory found. Uh, it's not a tool I've used. Uh, Displays internal structure. Can you get it to like try whatever? No. Uh, no, uh, I think there's something something corrupted there. So let's just try to make a zip file and make it like uh, file.test.zip and we take our fake flag. And then we open this and compare these two. So we have here a zip file record and there is a, uh, maybe we should actually name the, the file the same to actually get them to be as similar as possible. We can do this in a separate directory. 
So uh, let's remove that zip file, remove the flag.txt into this test file, test directory. We zip this up and we open this file. And we can, so here is the, um, the, the, the fully like non-corrupted zip file. And um, we can look at the three components we have here. We have the end locator, which is at the end of the file. This is where they start reading. So zip files are read kind of backwards. You first read this, the end where you get a pointer to where the central directory, the table of contents is, which is this part. And that one is then points to the individual records. Uh, so let's see if we have, so the end record starts with this 54B0506 bytes. And they don't seem to be present here. So could it be such a simple thing that it's just that the end record is missing. So let's just, you know, copy this over. And then we will need to, um, okay, it doesn't work. Uh, let's look at the top you have Some of the, oh, here is the end record. Okay, sorry, I'm, yeah. So you have the end record here. We can just compare these two to make sure that they are, like what, what the differences they have. Um, that was not a good way of comparing them. Um, what should the end record contain? It should contain the disk number, start disk number, entries on disk, entries in directory, directory size, directory offset, and the comment length. Okay, so let's look at the file here. We have first the like signature part, uh, then the disk number. Oh, here it says one, and here it says zero. So maybe if we change this, to oh we need to go in insert mode zero and we overwrite this with a zero so the disk number and start disk number and then entries on disk that would be one so that would be this one and then second one would be entries in directory and i think that's here they have two let's make it one and then we would have the offset 37 the size 50 maybe so i don't know let's save this as some kind of progress tumble part one or something maybe that would be enough to fix it uh, so let's try the fix part here again um, So, zip warning, zip file comment truncated, ignoring found end of record, says expect single disk archive, scanning for entries. Uh, Fixed.zip is 152 bytes. Uh, says it requires a password. And uh, yeah, that does not seem really correct. So it does seem to have parsed some data here. And that would be a file record. So in this case, it starts with the signature and then the version. This seems to be version 11. I mean, I don't know. It could, that could be actually be correct. Flags is one here. Flags is zero. Um, so 
compressed size, uncompressed size, file name length one. Yeah, that does not really seem correct. So, yeah, you can see that this is off because the data here, so we have the, if you look at the middle structure here, the directory entry, all of these chunks in the zip file, they start with this PK and then two numbers. And you can see that this is incorrect because here it thinks that the data part here goes all the way over here. That would not be correct because it should just go here so that this is the next chunk of data. So we would need to subtract like three bytes there. So if we change this compressed size to 47 and then rerun this, ah, now it looks better. So now it says that this is the directory entry for this. Signature version, uh, and there's some stuff here and then here again it says the compressed size is 50. Uh, so let's try to make it 47 again. And what else? The file name. Again, here is something something is off because it runs too far. So the file name length is one too many. Let's switch that on to eight. No, sorry, it's There's something else that's off here. So flag.txt and then it says extra field, extra comment. Maybe it's actually like missing bytes. So maybe the numbers themselves are correct, but there are like bytes missing. Um, that would be an alternative. If we go back and undo the changes. So in here, Maybe we just insert three null bytes. Um, but again, I mean, the file name can't possibly be a nine unless there are a few null bytes missing here as well. So one, two, three. Oh, sorry, wrong place. Here we should have. So now we have something. I mean, at least it parses the, the three components. Um, so let's uh, save that again and, and try this fix part. Oh yeah, now it's looking for those disk, other disk entries. So let's actually let's actually change those. Disk number zero, start disk zero, entries on disk one, entries in directory one. Save it again. So maybe I should remove the fixed one and just So fixed, try to unzip this. It says that it needs a password. So maybe that's because it has, maybe it's like, it says that it, has, that it is uh, encrypted. Maybe we can just flip the flag and it's actually not. Uh, where is that stored? So here is this compression type. Hmm. 
another thing you can try to do which is again a little bit of a cheat because in internally the zip file uses the so why do you why do i assume that having a password is something wrong here um i'm just assuming that because like we don't have any basically because it would be a poorly designed challenge because we don't have anything like hinting towards any kind of uh, password or um, it's just uh, I mean the, 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 the password could be anything I guess uh, in the other challenge there was at least like something hinting towards uh, like brute forcing uh, a password so for the time I'm going to assume that actually there isn't a password so we're gonna try another interesting little thing so internally let's search for so pk zip the zip format internally it uses the uh, uh, I mean it has a bunch of different algorithms but it has the deflate uh, algorithm And um, what you can do here is if we just guess that um, that while there have been some alterations of the zip file structure, the actual like deflate stream is uh, un uh, unmodified then we could actually just try to unzip this at every offset. So this is something you can try to use if you think you have some kind of like co corrupted um, compressed data. So we just read all the data here and then for every offset, um, we will try to decompress uh, this data and print it. And if we get an exception because we can't compress it, we just ignore that. So that did not work. So let's make sure we can try the different uh, parameters here. Um, Uh, uh, think you can fiddle with these think this is the one we should use with the minus 15 no well just let's just try them all so from like minus 15 to plus 47 uh, okay that did not work uh wait i didn't actually put in the offset here oh look that worked uh so what i did was like instead of trying to repair the zip file and like fix up all these data structures and make sure it all worked we can just try to find the raw uh compressed stream of data here in the middle of the file <clears throat> and decompress it so what we're doing is just um let me actually just then try to set this to the one I th thought it was going to be. Yeah. So we just take the uh, Clib um, library in Python, which has the same compression algorithm. And then just at every offset, we try to decompress the data using it uh, like this. 
So the question is, so can bin walk see co compressed stream? The problem with this is that it has like, it's the raw deflate stream without any header or anything. So I think if we do this with bin walk, no, you don't find it. Uh, but I think you can explicitly tell bin walk to like do this extraction, but it's the same as writing the script. Um, so yeah, that's like one way you can do it. If, if you think that the actual um, compressed data itself is uh, unaltered enough. So that was uh, some uh, forensics. So let's do this web one. So spoiler, all the fields in the zip were off by one. Okay, that's uh, interesting. So let's close this down, move over to the uh, DOS protection challenge. So my DOS protection is better than Cloudflare's bold claim. We download the oh we download the source code. We open this and we have this TypeScript code, which we're gonna go through. And then we also have this website with no front end. So just make a notes file. Okay, so what do we have here? Um, I, just like the other one, it's using the Express Web Framework. So let's look at the routes we have this API hash, API get flag, nice, which is a pretty big one. And then you have, yeah, that's it. Okay, so let's look at the API hash first. Uh, I think this is some kind of, constraint on what you're allowed to send maybe I haven't seen this in this usage of this filter thing before but uh, I think it's maybe like the that this input parameter must be one of these strings or something but let's verify that later um, anyway validation result validator okay some kind of validator otherwise it will call this string to hash with the input and then give us a substring like a part of the hash back and what's this uh, string to hash it makes like a bcrypt uh, thing out of this okay so let's just actually just try that. So we will get this thing here and then So this was a post, right, to API slash hash. And then the body, we have this input. And let's make it one of these test strings. And then print the response 
Let me try to run this code. Uh, sorry, this argument is called data. Okay, we seem to be able to to call the API. Uh, let's switch this to another of the test strings, like this one. Seems to work. What happens if we do something else? Invalid value. Okay, um, so we have something there. Then we have this other endpoint which says API get flag. So um, if the cooldown, so the cooldown is a, a map and it will take your IP address. Okay, so it will, if, if, if your IP address is still in this uh, cooldown list, then um, you have to wait. And then it puts you in the cooldown, it gets the ID and the hash from uh, the body, and make sure those are strings, and it will add one score to this user with some kind of expiry maybe maybe and then send okay but if we already have a score it will take the it will make a hash out of the id plus score and so this kind of like validate this let's say we're hashing our id which can be whatever we want and then the score and if that matches our score is incremented by one, and if if the score is above ten before the expiry time, we get the flag. And otherwise, if we are too slow, it will delete our score. Okay. Um, and then what do we have here as well? Um, so this hash function. So if this uh, if this filter would not have been here, then we could have just uh, created these uh, hashes that we want. We still have to bypass this cooldown thing somehow. Um, So how do we do that? Um, maybe this IP address. So this is from the requests uh, express library. Let's look that up express request.ip uh, okay search for ip 
IP. Uh, contains the remote IP address of the request. When the trust proxy setting does not evaluate to false, the value of this property is derived from the left leftmost entry in the X forwarded for header. This can be set. Oh, okay. Wait, could this be? Could that be set? Uh, All oh, right, here. So they set trust proxy to true and they probably exposed this. So that means that we could send, um, let's, uh, let's try this idea. So going to this one, add to the flag thing, and then it will take the ID and the hash. So ID, let's just do C2 and then hash. It's just something. And then we print the results of that. Um, or we can print this status code. So now it says wait. Uh, some time. Uh, so let's set the headers x forwarded for. So the reason, the, the, the real purpose of this uh, header is that when you're using like a proxy, you have like a web server and then your application server, then the, and maybe they are on the same server on the network or whatever, um, the actual like connection from the, to the application server will come from this web server. So you can't just look at the like TCP connection IP address. Uh, instead, you have to send this, set this HTTP header, the, the, the proxy, the front uh, end web server will need to set this X4 what is for uh, HTTP header. But if you then expose the application server directly, any client could just set that user, uh, set that header and spoof their IP address. Uh, so, yeah, and now we get past this check. So basically we should just do, just create like a random IP uh, every time we connect or, um, so let's just generate a random IP address. Uh, join random Rand in zero to fifty five and four of them. So we just generate the random IP address every time we uh, every time we make this request. So now I think we are then. The, the problem is that we're getting past this, but the this uh, check something is not working. So we have to defeat the hash now. So, um, we can call this hash function, but only if we get past this filter uh, uh, so what is the hash function doing again? Someone says one of your requests returned the 202 status code. Yeah, I think that was uh, here when we, the first request will go into this branch. It will not be on cooldown. Uh, it will have the proper things in the body and there will be no score uh, existing. And then uh, it will create this. It will be, if I change my ID, uh, 
that will be the case. And then you see errors and then switch. The first one is okay and then it errors. So uh, now we just need to, we need to defeat this part. Um, so Can we hash only these strings or is a way of bypassing? Because if we could bypass this filter, then we could just hash any value and then we just alternate like hash, submit, hash, submit uh, to increase uh, our score. So let's look at the hash function again and what is, see what it's doing. It takes the input, so it creates some kind of salt from the current time or whatever, and then, oh, so we also need to be quick because this the hash function, but that's not a problem because we have this uh, bypass the cooldown thing. So, and it will just hash the input. So, Um, so what's this validation result, is it? Hmm. I'm thinking if it's possible to like, maybe we should actually read the documentation about this uh, body input is in express up body is in, maybe we can find something in the documentation. Um, here is some, this is always good to read like bug reports. Uh, so, um, because sometimes they are not, not actual bugs, but just people misusing something and then you will give an, have an explanation here. Um, so here they have this filter and it says that, okay, so in this case, I think it's some, it seems to be, Body parser JSON. Yeah, so this is maybe something we could. Abuse because here it actually checks that the. That these two values are strings and nothing else, but here it doesn't seem to do that. Um, hmm. So maybe you could do some kind of trickery here. Let's see if is in hmm. So let's try to send some uh, JSON in the body instead. So we do this first. Just move this function up a little bit. And we don't care about this part for the time being. Someone says like, if, yeah, I'm happy to spoof the X44 like Intel. If you look at the cooldown check, the comparison is the wrong way. Oh, is there a bug here? If cooldown is... Right, this should be, <laughs> uh, this should be this way. But wait, so we don't have to do that part at all? Okay. 
whatever. Uh, that's uh, anyway. That's the thing to consider. I was misinterpreting the responses we were getting. Uh, so. Uh, Let's try this test thing. Okay, so we can submit the input as either like JSON or um, um, uh, JSON or just the forming code. So we can make this something other than a string. So how would that work then? Could we do like what happens if we make this like a list? We get an error. What happens if we have like Wait, now it dumps the salt. Maybe we can just use that to calculate the hash ourselves then. So Wait, why does this work? Didn't this? Okay, so it, if we have this string in the in the array, it would bypass the um, this filter because it's doing some kind of I don't know recursively or whatever but then when we actually send it to the hash function it will try to use this list as a salt and then it will print an error and this error is leaking the salt so we should be able to that's the only randomness in this uh, And it changes. Wait, isn't this supposed to be a little bit randomized? Okay, anyway, it doesn't really matter. We have this salt, and now we should just be able to call the bcrypt function uh, to to leak this. So let's just extract the salt from this request. Um, we strip, we split on new lines, we take the first new line. Uh, uh, sorry, we take the first line, we split that line on space, and we take the last entry. And then we just print this. Okay, so now we have the salt leaked. So now we should just be able to use uh, the bcrypt uh, function. So let's verify by doing the following. We uh, hash the same string locally as we do against the server. Um, and we see if they are the same. So maybe we need to actually do some changes in the yeah, looks like this is the same as this. So we just need to do 
Oh, because it includes the salt in the... Okay, so we just need to split on that and get rid of it. So split on the dot, yeah. So the test hash, we do a split on the dot, only split once. Take the last one, append the dot, like they did there. Uh, we treat this as ASCII characters. Oh, sorry. Ah, oh, no, okay. So this, we should decode this before we do all the splitting. So now you see that we can generate the same hash the server does. So now we should be able to... Um, so let's see, is that what the server actually... I mean, is, it was, is what it returns the same as what it uses for comparison. Hash, hash, substring 28. Yeah, sure, okay. So, pass data and salt. So we just move this here and Cool, so now we can just get our really nice score. Um, so we have this part with the get flag, and then we needed more than 10 score. So let's do this 11 times, and we... Um, so score, and we start at one for the first one. And then we need to set the hash is the, so the score hash is the hash of, what, what is the concatenation of ID plus the, the score turned to a string. So my ID. We hash this using the salt that we leaked, and then we submit this score hash and my ID, and we do this a couple of times, and something's off. Let's check this again. So the ID first and then the score. So, so uh, the uh, we informed here in the chat that it's, an, it's a bug in the express validator package. So if you send an array of size one, with the only element being the first element in the validation array, it will pass. Oh, so it just, it worked simply because I chose this specific string, but it wouldn't have worked with any of the others. Uh, that's interesting. So what's the problem here then? Um, We should get mm. 
So just print these things. Should not be a problem. Oh, wait, actually. No, this is suddenly returning more. Maybe I was a little bit too quick here. Let's check again with the, the hashes. Oh, there's a, oh, this should be, The test hash. Okay, maybe just go from a fixed number of characters. So this is twenty nine characters. Oh, sorry, it's with the dot that we added on. So let's just do. this instead. Okay, now that works. Sorry, it was a mistake in the hashing code. So now we should be able to do this. Mm, we're not. Um, yes, just switch my ID. So, something's wrong here. Oh wait, when they're comparing the hash, they're not taking the, oh, so stupid. Uh, okay, so when we do the full hash, we should actually not, strip any parts of it that's just when we and we test it here it's still not working though so maybe we should try maybe we should try to run this code locally actually um, <laughs> they hash it. And just return that. And that's what I'm doing as well. So first of all, do I need like a TypeScript compiler for this? Yes. Um, to actually run this. Oh, okay. Wait. Okay, I don't have this installed. So <clears throat> TypeScript is a programming language that is then compiled into uh, JavaScript and um, uh, we have a bunch of errors. 
Uh, it's a lot of modules it can't find. Yeah, this is a little bit annoying. I guess we could just install all of these. Um, we'll see. Let's let's try again. And see if the code, if there are any obvious issues with the code. Um, let's try another um, test string. to make sure that we can hash any of these. So let's take this one. We do get the same hash. Okay, so why is it not working? Um, I mean, we do get the correct salt because we are able to generate the same um, we're able to generate the same hash as the server gives us back. <clears throat> so, and now we're hashing a completely different string. And the score is in increments of one, right? You start with a one score. And then, oh, the score should be, right, it should be the current score. Okay, it was an off by one uh, error by me. That was stupid. But yeah, it's always important to, you know, check your code um, and really you know try to go through all the small parts and debug it um, so what we did then was uh, okay first of all we used the x forwarded for header even though it was actually not necessary and the reason it works is that this uh, configuration is set trust proxy uh, true but there is no proxy in front so we can just give it the x for forwarded for header to say that we are from a completely different IP address and we can make however many uh, requests we want. And then the second part is that we can, by uh, using a bug in this uh, input filter, we can get it to take a list as input. And then when it try to hash that list, it will throw an error and leak the salt, which we can then use to compute the hash locally and use it to update our score and finally uh, get our score high enough to get the flag. So yeah, that was it. And we did this, uh, the IP thing we found by reading the documentation, always a good thing when you encounter some kind of uh, framework or something, don't assume that a specific function or something <clears throat> does something just because like a function is named something or, you know, what it should do or whatever. So now let's try the uh, boot to root um, challenges. <clears throat> so set this up, close this down. 
So this is uh, another of the sponsor uh, challenges. It's a sequence of three uh, challenges on the same server. So part one of our three. So a developer played around some with PHP, but they forgot to close down the web server. Uh, brute forcing will not help you. You cannot use like uh, Deer Buster, Go Buster and similar stuff. So let's go to this uh, URL. I can't reach it. So because I think we had like IP whitelisting stuff on this. So I need to ping. Um, oh, sorry. It's a new it's a new IP address. That was the case. Yes. So here is the website. OK. So it starts out as a web challenge. Uh, we have contact form. That's good. Um, that's interesting. We keep that in mind. Is there anything else we have? Generic, not found. Elements, not found. So maybe it's just this single page. Check the source code. Interesting. Uh, let's see what happens if we send something in this form. Um, network tab, send the message. It didn't submit anything. So this maybe let's look at this JavaScript thing. Oh, console log. Hey, hi, SSM, the competition. So is any of this related to, this is most a, more a layout thing. I, I want to see if anything is related to like uh, submitting the form or if it's just things re related to layout. Doesn't really seem to be placeholder panel, no. So seems to be just a static page, but it said in the hint that it was playing around with PHP. So what if we switch to like index.php, PHP info? No. I mean, on the other hand, it said that it wouldn't help with like brute forcing or deer busting or anything. So it shouldn't really be. Um, shouldn't be required. So let's look in this directory. If they have like directory listing on, they do. However, these are only the, yeah. Are there any other directory assets? Okay, so nothing in those. Um, so what else could there be? A Um, I mean, we just need to find there's a single one down here. Why is that some for someone forgot something in the code? Um, So let's read the description here. Uh, played around with PHP. So uh, 
doesn't really seem to be anything other than this just static site. Could there be something at like robots.txt? Oh, look. So that's a file that you should always check, robots.txt. Robots and here there's a reference to a network.php. So let's check this one. And it says, click me. Oh, okay. So here you can see that on this page, we have a parameter, which is this IP is this, and then we get this output. And this looks very familiar from the output of the ping command. Yeah, it's probably a line break here as well, actually. In the, yeah, exactly. So this is definitely just from the output from the ping command. This means that we probably have a command injection uh, vulnerability here. So that means that the, uh, the, 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 the program is just doing something, probably something like this, ping and then the IP address and that's it. So this means that we could just like put in a semicolon and do another command. So what if we do like this? Uh, let's do it in here, it's that's mute. So it doesn't really seem to work. Uh, what if we do something like just a sleep? Now it's very slow. Okay, so somehow we're not really getting the output from this, but we're still able to run a command. So that means that we can in like run commands, but we can't really see the results. So what we could do here is we could try to do like a reverse shell to, um, so I have a, I have a server on the internet. Um, and it has a port open. And uh, so now I can set up a netcat listener on this port and you can read up on this. Uh, so this is called, what we're doing now is called a reverse shell. So you can search for like reverse shell netcat. Actually, I'm going to need to do that because I want to run the so basically on, on your end, you, you just run, you just open like a server listening on this port. And then on the victim, you uh, run something like this. Um, now, I'm this variant here that uses netcat and dash e, that only works on one. This is when I talked about in one of the previous parts about like different flavors of netcat. And this only works on like one of the flavors. But what you can also do is you can use bash for this. If there's bash on the server, um, yeah, this one is pretty nice. Um, so I have port 5000 and uh, this should be the IP address on my, on my server. Now you could of course mess with my stream by connecting to this um, oh, we need to uh, URL is, uh, escape this. So ASCII code, ASCII table, um, and the AND sign is 26. So percent 26 of those. And then we should, and these should be uh, Pluses. 
So this should be a properly URL encoded variant of this. Oh, hacker attempt detected. Okay, so that was a bit too easy. Um, so what part of this causes the hacker attempt? It's not bash. Is it... So if we take like half of this... Maybe it's the greater than, no. Is it the slash? Oh, it's the slash. Okay, so let's try the netcat flavor one. Otherwise there are other, you see, you can do this uh, in a bunch of different ways. So apparently uh, the slash is disallowed. So which is a problem of course then let's see if we could just run this without the absolute path. I don't think that will work, maybe. Okay, it did work but it times out. So is, are we... So let's set up this listener again. Try this again. And it stops. So do we need to... So could we like URL encode or uh, I guess the slash part is a problem here. Yeah. Hey, uh, how do we get past this? Can we do like, uh, can we do eval? Yes, and we can do, can we do a subshell? No, is the dollar sign. What about the Okay, that works. So, new idea. We need this command to be run. But we, what we could do is we base64 encode the command we want to run. Um, and then we base64 decode it and then we eval that. Uh, just need to URL encode those um, equal signs, 3D. So let's set up this listener again. attempt detected oh sorry we couldn't use the dollar sign we have to use it I'm so used to that syntax so we do this instead hmm not allowed what part is it does, doesn't like is it is it the quotes Not the quotes. Is it the pipe? Uh, I guess it could be the pipe. Yes. Okay, so let's. Um, instead, you can do.
Um, I guess we could hex escape it with the echo dash e. So you can do like this. Yes. Is the backslash allowed? Is then the next question. Someone asked if slash is really disallowed. No, it isn't. Okay, so what part was. So when I did this. Okay, maybe I was mistaken. Let's set up this listener again. Okay, sorry, I uh, just made a mistake. Uh, I don't know exactly what I tried. So here we have our reverse shell. Um, so where are we? We are in this directory. Who are we? We are this www data. Um, Network.php. Is this it's the file we have? We can uh, store this file, save this file locally just to have it. Net work.php so let's uh, check the root nothing here maybe look in the see what users we have uh, so there's a root to David know it the sponsor um, Let's go back. Uh, someone says, upgrade your shell. Uh, yeah, I probably should, but there's a suggestion for a command here. Uh, yeah, okay, let's try this. Okay, now I have a better shell. So is there a WordPress folder here as well? That's interesting. Um, okay. By the way, we should look for a, uh, I mean, I think this, sh this should be like the first step and we should just get Uh, this might have been a bad idea. Oh, now I disconnected again. Okay, let's. So I'm not sure what we're looking for, but um, here is a WordPress uh, configuration file. So here we have some database credentials. Uh, that's uh, also interesting. Uh, maybe we could actually connect to the database. So, um, oh, there's no, I guess, do we have, right, can we write to any of these? Um, guess we could use just PHP to do we have PHP yes oh no this was a bad idea uh, 
Okay, I have to re redo that. So, uh, we should, I mean, the PHP code should have, uh, I mean, the PHP installation should have the um, MySQL uh, libraries installed. So, first, I'm just going to copy the stuff we actually used. And uh, this is all scratch stuff. Um, okay. Mm. Let's try it again. Now suddenly I can't run this command. Interesting. Okay, it shouldn't really matter. Um, okay, so we could we can create um, files here. We could even download files. Uh, so. To make it simple, what you can do is let's create this, like um, we want to dump some stuff from the database. Actually, let's see if, uh, do we have any, Okay, now let's go the, the PHP way. Uh, so let's write some PHP code to just PHP, MySQL, connect. Yeah, I haven't written PHP code in a very long time. So the database is this know it db username David password is winter. We just uh, create a connection, PHP MySQL, and then we want to write a query. Uh, all right, I think we do like something like this. Um, and then it's called information schema tables, I think. Yes. And then We just we should be able to just like iterate over yeah exactly Uh, no, wait, result. Oh, just want to loop through this and result loop print. Just give me something that I can copy, fetch array. So we just do var dump row. 
So this is a piece of PHP code we want to get onto the server and run. So let's um, use ngrok and Python to set up a, first of all, do we have, yes. So, um, what did we call it? Dump db.php. Okay, cool. So we can download this onto the server and then we should be able to run this. I really thought so at least. Uh, is it called this or just, oh no, oh. Okay, restart the shell. Maybe this database doesn't contain anything at all. That would be... Now, for some reason, I can't run this command. Um, why? That's very strange. Um, oh, there are multiple of these running. So maybe just kill all the ones. Okay, still didn't work. Um, maybe we should use, not use the MySQLi version of this. First of all, what happens if we, um, should close down a few tabs. Just do like a select example. So just dump all this MySQL connect and then query. So MySQL connect host user password server name username someone says that this could take a while um, not yet uh, let's see if uh, Let's so we just dump out the row. Okay, so we try again to um, To fetch this file. Dump the db.php. Uh, 
Okay, that didn't work. Um, so maybe let's leave that for a while then. Let's check in the home directory of... Oh, maybe the David guy has something here. User flag. Test.py. So... That's interesting. Um, but it's not readable by us. So are there any like pseudo commands we can run? Or is it? Uh, is that pseudo list commands? for users. Yeah, so it's maybe we're not allowed to run anything. Try something like line num. What? What's Oh, okay. Uh, identify privilege escalation things. Yes, you could probably do something like that, but let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Um, so, is there anything in the. Oh, there's a flag here. Aha! Okay, so first flag. Nope. <laughs> okay. So this was in home data flag.txt. So we get that. And we move on to step two of this user. Uh, David had not thought that someone from the outside would get access to the server. See if you can find any sensitive information to get to the next flag. Okay. Let's set up that shell again. Okay, now I could do this. Weird. Um, okay, so let's see what we have in these directories. Know it, WordPress, David, we had this test up. And then what's in the root two? Um, Okay, so I guess, wait, what if this database passwords, like username and password, what if this is actually David's password? So can we, how do we do that? Do we do this, this, this and then password winter? It worked. Okay, so he was using the same um, so it was actually relevant that we found this file. So in the uh, WordPress directory, we had the VP config file where we had the username and the database for the password, uh, the username and the password for the database. Uh, and that also happens to be the same as for the user, uh, David. So, he reused the password and now he suffers the consequences because I just got his flag. So yeah, that was a bit faster. Um, so now we're getting to step three. 
uh, I'm just going to close down a whole bunch of things. And what's the description of number three? Can you escalate your permissions and gain almost full control over this machine? And I said, now you can SSH for better shell. That's a very good point. Let's uh, try that. Um, we SSH David at this IP address. Yes, we trust the server. Can we log in? Right, we could do that. So we just drop this whole thing and we don't need no web server either anymore then because we can just work with this um, as if we are David. So now let's try this pseudo thing. Uh, Uh, you should be able to Maybe not. Let's see here. What's this test.py? Um if Um, that's interesting. Can we like just Google this MD5 hash? Crack station. Okay. This is a cracked hash, but I mean, it's doesn't really matter because I mean we can't run this I mean sure we can run this um, but oh okay that was just bullshit then we can read the success.py file Okay, so that was just a red herring uh, thing. Um, well, thanks. So, can we read any? Hmm. Still want to see. So sudo list commands. This is because this is like a typical thing you would have in like a. Yeah, we should be able to do. And then the sudo password. Can we just. I guess he's not allowed even to. No, wait. Oh, we just needed to put in his password. Okay, I was almost there. Aha. Uh -huh. So. Let's see. Um, you may run the following commands. Any thing Python and then this as a argument so wait can you do a will this work with like a backslash thing so could you do first of all
Could you do then pseudo this and then no, that wouldn't work. User David. Oh, I need to write. Okay, so we are allowed to run this. I wonder if this means that we can just put in. Hmm. Could we do just create a temporary file like a.py and then just do print hello? Could we take this same command but just insert this in between? No, that's not how it works. Um, so I'm wondering if you could do something like this if you had like if there was a directory in this in this bin uh, so you could do find in user bin type d hmm let's look at that then um sudo command star someone asked is an asterisk in sudo command specification safe uh Pseudo on the other hand, treats it to simply catch all wildcard for any further parameter in that single command. Okay. Then basically, if there is anything that starts with Python. What's Python 3M? So someone has a the stream crashed. I don't see any issues. So how can someone else confirm? I think this th the stream is working fine. Um, so let's look at this test script again. Oh no, look, this is, this is the exploit. So you see that this, uh, This thing here will work relative to your current working directory. So it just assumes that we're running this from David's user folder. So that would go up one step, down the route two, and then run the success. But if we are somewhere else, let's say we are in temp. In temp, we create a directory called root two. We go into root two. 
we create a Python script called success.py and uh, we make it actually not a Python script at all. We just make it run a uh, shell script running a bin uh, bash. And then we make this uh, executable. And then from this directory, we run, uh, so we take this code, but we, and we have the full path to his script. And then, so we are in this temp file. We run this and we need to s provide the correct password. Oh, this was a, wait, that's another way to exploit this. If you run it with Python 2, uh, Okay, so there are two ways to exploit this. Either you do what I was about to do, which is um, if you look at this script, so you see that it, it asks for your input uh, through the input function. And this function is different in Python 2 and 3. In Python 3, it's just like it just takes input, provides, gives it as a string to the program. In Python 2, it takes a string, runs eval on it, and then gives the result back. So we can just in, uh, input this uh, command, which you will recognize from the uh, calculator Python Python jail uh, thing that I did in the first part, and we spawn a shell. The other way of doing it is to exploit the fact that it uses a relative path here. So you change your working directory to uh, slash temp slash root two. In this, we created a file called success.py, which is just a script that runs, runs bash. And then uh, you run this with Python 3 instead. Uh, sorry, we need to Python 3 and you provide this and you become root 2 and you get the flag. So two different solutions. Um, To this and I guess this is also like a recruitment uh, congratulations you completed no it's boot to root challenge yes and no it was one of the uh, sponsors for the competition so they made this sequence of uh, challenges so nice little sequence of challenges so now there is like a, a dark spot on this uh, on this uh, challenge board and it's this uh, AES challenge and I will actually not solve it uh, on stream uh, but I will walk you through it and I will talk about the concept of it but um, we'll actually leave it and you will have to read up on the uh, solutions from the uh, author but uh, let's just look at it again yeah um. so save this um Oh, wait. Oh, 
Okay, so in this challenge, and I talked about this at the end of the other um, stream, we're given a implementation of AES. And in this implementation, the S box has been modified to just be the identity uh, S box, which means that the, the whole S box step is unnecessary. It means specifically that this line here can be replaced instead of XORing with the S box entry of that round key, we can just, since the S box is just the identity function, we can just remove it and just XOR with the uh, round key. Um, So there's a question, have you done anything special to forward your keys to the VM? They seem to work so flawlessly compared to what I've tried on VBox VMware, especially with all your coding shortcuts. Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I do use their, uh, I use the VMware workstation and I use their, like they have this uh, keyboard or like you, their full USB driver stack thing. But uh, uh, no, I don't think so. I use Windows as a host OS. Um, if that would make any difference. So here we could just replace this um, and here we could just replace it with this and it would be functionally equivalent. So we just get rid of the whole S box thing. Um, so what does, what does that mean? That means that in every iteration of this AES implementation, it's just the shift rows, mix columns and add round key steps. And uh, yes, question, what VM host software are you using? Yeah, I'm using VMware workstation. Uh, but I used I used to use VirtualBox for many years. I just switched to VMware like I don't think like less than a year ago, and uh, very minor changes is like slightly slightly more stable. I think it's I think it's primarily good if you're doing more advanced stuff that I want to that than what I'm actually doing. But yeah, so anyway, AES it will only have the shift rows, mix columns, and add round key steps, and the mix columns and shift row steps they are completely uh, invertible. Uh, so you can just work your way backwards. The round key is that XORs in these round keys. So it uses an algorithm to uh, um, it uses the original 16 byte key to generate 11 round keys. And those round keys in each step, they're XORed into the state uh, matrix. And we, the challenge, uh, for those who didn't watch the other part, is that we can connect to this server. It will give you the flag encrypted with this block cipher, but with a random key. And then you can provide it with uh, any 16 bytes you want, and it will encrypt it for you using this uh, flawed implementation. So using that as an oracle, you are able to uh, deduce the, the key. Now, I was trying earlier today to use uh, C3 for this, to just set up these, uh, the key as symbolic inputs and then like let it solve for the key. Uh, but that didn't really work out. So I'm not sure. I mean, what you could do, of course, is just m manually work out the maths you will end up with some huge uh, equations, but it should be, I mean, it should be fairly simple, like structurally simple uh, set of equations, I think, uh, and you can solve them. You could also do some kind of like taint analysis thing and run a lot of like inputs and outputs and see how they uh, relate to each other. And uh, yeah. But uh, 
I don't think I have a quick, easy solution to, the, to this. Uh, I think it's, I mean, it's, there isn't really any complicated maths involved uh, in this really. Uh, it's just that it's a, a whole lot of, since, since we remove this S box, the sub byte step, uh, I mean, you can like undo this uh, mix column step by, uh, you know, multiplying with the inverse of this and, and the shift rows is also easily uh, undoable. So yeah, it should be fairly simple to just set up some code to try to like calculate the key given input and output pairs, key, input and output pairs. But yeah, I will unfortunately have to refer you to the uh, one of the write-ups. I should see if, uh, is that repository published yet? The uh, write-up with the uh, write-up repository? Um, so, yeah, I think it is. Yes, so there's a repository here with solutions to these. So let's see if we have the, no, sorry, that was the wrong one. Um, so the solution, uh, yeah, so here's the same thing. The only difference is the S box has been um, disabled. Okay, so now since the S-box is broken, the crypto becomes fully linear. So we can just express this as a matrix multiplication uh, with the bit uh, matrices. Uh, and then you can invert this construct. And so you don't actually recover the actual key, but you basically recover this, uh, these matrices A and B, uh, and they are kind of like, they encode the whole operation of the cipher, including like with the key baked into it. And then you can use that matrix to invert this, uh, encryption, uh, with the flag, and then you would get the decrypted flag. Okay. That's, um. That's pretty neat. I uh, that would have taken me some some time to figure out. So yeah, with that we have uh, worked through. Uh, well, I've solved all of the challenges except the AES one. Um, I will have to surrender to that one. And uh, yeah, that's it. So if you have any uh, questions or comments or anything, please uh, write them in the chat now. Otherwise, we'll be closing this down for for this time and thanks to everyone participating in the competition and thanks to everyone who helped organize it. And yes, this is something I almost missed. If you think that this was a fun competition, make sure to sign up for the Midnight Sun uh, CTF qualifiers. Uh, it runs for 24 hours, uh, April uh, 3rd to 4th. We just opened the registrations and uh, it's an online qualifier for 24 hours and the top teams will qualify for a finals in Stockholm. Uh, it was supposed to be uh, in the middle of June, but due to the current situation, it's probably gonna be uh, postponed, but we will have more information on that uh, later. Um, so the top two teams, uh, well, apart from what and ever, because they, they, they surrendered their uh, price on this point, but the other two top teams, um, these two teams, Dagi CTF and Bumi Bjornana, they will, they, what they want now is that they together will form a team that will be qu qualified for the Midnight Sun CTF finals. But uh, all of you others, you also have uh, a chance to qualify by signing up for the qualifiers and play it April 3rd to uh, 4th. So uh, gather some friends. There is no uh, limit in the number of people you can be uh, when you do the online qualifiers. 
Uh, however, for the finals, there is a limit of five or six uh, people, depending on if you're a student or not. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind. You can read about it uh, here at uh, midnightsunctf.se. So yeah, with that, um, thanks for today and uh, have a nice evening or you know whatever time it is where you're watching from. Uh, goodbye.